Let's spend a few minutes talking about the Clostridia. When we talk about it in that plural sense, the Clostridia, what we mean are species within the genus Clostridium. Now, Clostridia are gram-positive spore-forming bacilli, and unlike their close relatives Bacillus species, the Clostridia are strict anaerobes. Whereas among bacilli, there are obligate aerobes and there are facultative aerobes, meaning they can switch back and forth between oxygen utilization and some anaerobic metabolism. We'll learn about those anaerobic options later. Uh, the Clostridia cannot switch, and in fact, oxygen is toxic to them. Their endospores that they form are not sensitive to oxygen, but the vegetative, live, active, metabolizing cells are in fact sensitive to, uh, to the air. So the Clostridia are, are genetically and in many ways ecologically very similar to the Bacillus species, with this big exception that they cannot tolerate oxygen and they have to live via fermentation. There are four important pathogens among the Clostridia that I want to introduce you to. Clostridium tetani, which causes tetanus. Uh, Clostridium tetani is naturally found in soil, which is why your mom always used to tell you if you step on a rusty nail, you got to make sure your tetanus shot is, is up to date. Now, I don't know where the rust comes in, but a nail that was out in the dirt has the potential to embed spores of Clostridium tetani deep into your tissues. It doesn't have to be a nail, it could be any other thing you step on that provides a deep puncture. That deep puncture gets away from a lot of the vasculature and gets far from oxygen. The closer you get to the bone, the less oxygen there's going to be. So the deeper the puncture and the dirtier from a like an actual soil uh, meaning of the word dirt, the dirtier the, uh, the, the utensil is, uh, the more, more of a threat there is for tetanus. So we need to keep up with our tetanus shots uh, minimum every 10 years. They're naturally found in soil. Some animal feces, uh, the toxin that they produce leads to a very rigid paralysis and it has a very high mortality rate associated with it. Next one on the list is Clostridium botulinum. It causes the disease botulism. Very similar to Clostridium tetani. The tetanus toxin, or the, pardon me, the botulinum toxin is very similar to tetanus toxin, except that it causes a flaccid or limp paralysis where the muscles can't contract. Now with both of these, tetani and botulinum, typically what kills the patient, or at least one of the things that can ultimately kill the host, is suffocation. If your lungs lock up and your diaphragm locks up and you can't uh, exhale or inhale, you're gonna suffocate. If you have flaccid paralysis, uh, not a rigid one like you do with tetani, but with botulinum you have this limp paralysis, same thing's a problem. Your, your lungs and your diaphragm are going to go limp and you can't breathe and uh, ultimately that's bad. So where do we find Clostridium botulinum? We find it in soil, freshwater sediments. What's the link between Clostridium botulinum and, and canning? How do people get the disease botulism from improperly canned foods? I want you to think that through, okay? You should consider where Clostridium botulinum lives. You should consider what goes into the can and the whole canning process. Consider the process of attempting to sterilize the canned foods, and then how we might be able to detect it before consuming some food that had been tainted with Clostridium botulinum. Think that through on your own. Let me know if you have questions about that. Two more we're interested in, Clostridium perfringens is one of many bacteria that can cause gas gangrene. Gas gangrene is when uh, tissue has died, maybe from an injury, frostbite, things like that. Um, and it's the, the bacteria, Clostridium perfringens or, or another one, gets into the tissue and begins actually fermenting the tissue. And it's fermenting the tissue so aggressively, in some cases, bubbles are visible. And that's where this gas term comes in, the, in the, the name of the, the infection, gas gangrene. Uh, C. perfringens can also be involved in some food poisonings. It is a very invasive, destructive organism, meaning that it doesn't just sort of sit in one location and cause disease from there. It burrows into the tissues. Uh, we'll talk more later in the semester about how that happens, these virulence mechanisms, but it, it really invades those tissues um, pretty significantly. Perfringens is the only species among the Clostridia that I'm aware of that is highly invasive like that. Tetani doesn't like the human body as a, a petri dish. So the, the, we embed 
cells of tetani deep and they cause tetanus, but they're not really growing and invading those tissues. Same with botulinum, we consume the toxin, the cells might even be dead by the time we consume the toxin. Perfringens, on the other hand, is highly invasive and can cause some pretty destructive disease. The fourth one is called uh, Clostridium difficile. Clinically, that's really frequently referred to as C. diff. You'll hear that term a lot. C. diff is particularly notorious for colitis and antibiotic-associated diarrhea. When we take antibiotics, we wipe out the susceptible microorganisms in and on our bodies. C. diff, however, can survive because it can sporulate. So could these others, but they don't seem to be involved in this form of disease though. Uh, so if you happen to be a person that's carrying C. diff at the time, and they say that somewhere around two or three percent of us are carrying C. diff in our gut at any particular time. We take oral antibiotics, saturates our intestinal tract, kills off all the competition. These little spores of C. diff wake up, they've got no competition and they can take over and overgrow the intestines and when they do that they're very difficult to get rid of and they cause pretty severe diarrhea and if that goes untreated it can lead to colitis or severe chronic inflammation of the colon. Let's take a look at C. diff itself in a little bit more detail. It is commensal gut flora. Commensal means that it's living there happily without causing too much harm in uh, a couple percent of the population. Uh, that means you get a room of 100 people and anywhere from two to five of them are carrying C. diff at any given time. Uh, it can cause uh, AAD and colitis as we talked about, mostly due to overgrowth in the intestines because the spores are surviving. Um, and the spores survive, they revegetate. If we hit them with another round of antibiotics, we'll kill the vegetative cells, but they will uh, still produce spores. And when the course of antibiotics is done, the spores will revegetate and the problem will come back. Very, very difficult to get rid of. Not impossible, but it's, it's not a simple um, you know, 10 day course of antibiotics and get on with life. This is a common super infection. Super infection doesn't mean it's like super duper or whatever. It just means it's on top of another treatment or infection. So you're taking antibiotics for a sinus infection and all of a sudden you're susceptible to, uh, to a C. diff, uh, antibiotic associated diarrhea, something like that. So it's a common super infection in the elderly, in the immunocompromised, and especially in patients that have extended use of antibiotics. You'll hear the, the antibiotic clindamycin kicked around a lot. Um, some people believe that uh, extensive use of high doses of clindamycin is one of the guiltiest parties for causing C. diff. I've heard people argue uh, against that as well, um, but uh, that seems to be a, a, a growing belief. It's difficult to diagnose and difficult to treat. <clears throat> How does it get in? How does it cause disease? Well, it's transmitted by everybody's favorite fecal oral route of transmission. So it goes from the feces of one person to the mouth of another. Now it doesn't mean you're eating poop. It means that uh, you know you went to your favorite taco shop and someone who is C. diff positive, maybe not sick, but C. diff positive, uh, didn't do as good of a job washing their hands. Um, it turns out that uh, that uh, alcohol hand rubs, hand sanitizers, do not kill C. diff spores. So if someone goes to the bathroom and is carrying C. diff, even if they're asymptomatic, and they clean their hands with alcohol hand sanitizer, they may still have uh, viable spores on their hands. Then he goes and makes your burrito, you consume it, and now you're C. diff positive. Doesn't mean you're going to get sick right away. It's not very competitive in your gut. But at some point, it may cause infection, especially if somewhere down the road, you have to be on some pretty intensive antibiotics for an operation, infection, etc. <clears throat> it's often uh, cited that healthcare personnel hand hygiene is at the heart of mitigating these C. diff infections. So folks that are handling patients, bouncing around between healthy patients, healthy patients, maybe there's no such thing, between C. diff positive patients and C. diff negative patients may actually transfer them from one person to a, a vulnerable host. This is a frequently in what we call a nosocomial contaminant. Nosocomial is a term that means hospital acquired. Two possible toxins, we simply call them A and B because we don't want to get more complicated than that apparently. Toxin A is very common. Toxin B, which is lethal, is not particularly common. Um, metronidazole and oral vancomycin. Vancomycin is typically given intravenously. 
But think about that. An intravenous drug trying to treat a gut infection, you're not going to get a whole lot of that drug leaking across into the lumen of the intestinal tract. If you take it orally, on the other hand, you can actually keep it in the intestinal tract because vanc is not well absorbed by the intestinal lining, which means that you can give a pretty high dose of a drug that won't treat the rest of the body. It's just going to treat the gram positives because vanc is an anti-gram positive antibiotic just treat the gram positives found in the intestinal tract and no place else. Oral vanc uh, combined with metronidazole is one of the most common uh, treatments that I've, I've read about and heard from from patients. Um, it can lead to pseudomem pseudomembranous colitis, which is a very severe form of colitis, which can in fact be life-threatening, where large sections of the colon wall literally slough off uh, in the feces, can lead to holes in the intestinal wall that can lead to intestinal leakage into the peritoneal cavity, um, and you can you can picture all the downstream problems that something like that would cause. Believe it or not, one of the most popular ways to deal with this is a fecal transplant. Uh, this is not um, a once one in a million article here. Go Google fecal transplant and see how many articles you find about this. Patients with C diff can have 20 or more stools a day. Let's read this at the bottom from this article, which seriously affects quality of life, you can imagine. And so they're often very open to this treatment. Human beings are 90% bacteria. That's, um, that's about right. We're outnumbered 10 to 1. Once the balance is altered by antibiotics, opportunistic infections can cause serious problems. All we're doing with this treatment is resetting the balance. Read about how fecal transplants work. Basically, you take the healthy microbiota of one person's intestines and you get it into the intestines of another. There are pills that are dried feces that can be passed along that might work. Um, there's uh, um, sort of an enema type approach where you're going in the back door. Problem is, the patient often poops everything back out again before it starts to take. The uh, most effective way that I've read about is through uh, an intubation, a gastro tube that goes down the stomach, and then uh, a Slurpee of saline and a healthy person's feces gets fed down into the stomach and then leaks uh, past the pyloric sphincter into the duodenum, into the small intestine, into the large intestine, and allows those microbes to naturally recolonize. From some of the, the testimonies I've read, um, sometimes they're, they're looking at, at literally overnight relief. So you take someone who's been dealing with diarrhea multiple times a day for a year, and all of a sudden they've got their life back. Uh, as gross as it sounds, I think this is one of the treatments we're going to see uh, even more commonly in the future. All right, so that ends our discussion of the Clostridia. I hope it was helpful to you. I hope you take some time to work through it and think about it, read it a couple times, rather listen to it a couple times, and make sure you feel you understand this material.